The young lady entered the shop, sounding the little trinket attached to it. The sound startled the old woman, Rahali, sitting behind the counter. She was probably in her seventies, half asleep, tired already, even if the day was just starting. But it was normal during the hot summers in Marrakesh. Hello, said the young lady. I'm, I'm sorry to bother you. I need the services of the public writer if he's available. Of course, my child. What is your message? Let me transmit it to him. He is in his workshop behind, taking care of a few orders. Telling her, the young lady patiently waited in the shop, hearing her stomach growl. She couldn't have any breakfast today. Her family doesn't have enough food. She will have to do without. Coming back, with a gentle smile on her face, Rahali handed her the piece of paper. Paying for the service, the young girl was about to leave when the woman said, Wait, my child, my, my lunch is almost ready, but I don't have the strength to go upstairs on my own. The man of the house is busy. Can I ask you to help me? You can stay and share the meal with me. I only have a modest soup and some bread, but times are hard. Please? Her stomach growling again, the young lady hesitated, but ended up agreeing. Going upstairs, devouring her meal while chatting with the nice woman, she started to feel a little tired. Maybe she ate too much. She wasn't used to it anymore. All of a sudden, the young lady saw a man entering the kitchen, knife in hand. Just when she lost consciousness, the fear and confusion drawn on her face. She fell head first on the table, asleep. Close your door, turn your lights off, and let's get started. The Kingdom of Morocco with its capital Rabat is where our cruise will take us today. The country is the host of a vibrant culture mixing Arabic, Berber and European. Morocco's strategic location near the mouth of the Mediterranean attracted renewed interest of European powers in the early 20th century. Everyone wanted a piece of the cake. Morocco became the theatre of multiple war scenes, like but not limited to the Franco-Moroccan War in 1844, the Hispano-Moroccan War between 1859 and 1860, and many different treaties granting several rights to foreigners. Morocco nominally was ruled by its Sultan, the young Abdel Aziz, through his regent Bahmed. By 1900s, after witnessing so many local wars started by pretenders to the Sultanate, by bankruptcy of the treasury and by multiple tribal revolts, its population fell victim to famine from 1903 to 1907. It is in this very uncertain environment that our story will begin. Marrakesh of the early 20th century was a city plagued by anarchy. Being the epicenter of trading within the African continent, therefore many traders as well as foreigners came and went all the time, making it very difficult for the local guards to follow up with the rising crime rate. Despite the tension, it still had the charm it is known for today, its hot weather, its large souks with all sorts of shops, from tea makers to snake charmers, anything you could think you could probably find it there. But there were some trades that disappear today, such as public writers. At that time, trading was flourishing with foreigners from different countries roaming the streets of the city. Wary of them but accepting still, the population tried to live their life as normally as they could, until things started to change. In April 1906, more and more locals started to complain about their missing daughters or sisters. One, two, ten, twenty, thirty girls already were gone, and the authorities didn't seem to be willing to open any investigation. 
they of course had better to do, sarcastically commenting that they shouldn't leave their girls out. A woman, of course, is supposed to stay at home. It was the family's fault if she disappeared. The families, shocked and worried, grew more suspect of the foreigners in the city, convinced they were stealing their daughters and taking them back to their countries. All the disappearances were very young girls between the age of 16 and 24, easily fooled. Maybe they tricked them, offering them money or food during that time of famine in the country. It was very probable. Girls kept disappearing nonetheless. The victim's count was already at 36. But the parents of the 36th victim, after reporting their missing daughter, didn't count on the police and decided to open their own investigation. So it wasn't long before they, step by step, went to each of the shops their daughter visited, asking questions until reaching the shoemaker and public writer's shop. The public writer there wasn't appreciated by his neighbors, too mysterious, as if he was hiding something. There were even rumors that he killed two people and somehow got away with it. People avoided him, but still had to deal with him since he was one of the few shoemakers at the time. Pushing the door, sounding the little trinket, the father and his three sons entered the shop. Rahali looked up from behind her counter and welcomed them with a warm smile. Hello, how can I help you today? We are looking for my daughter. We know this was her last known stop before heading back home, since she took care of all the chores beforehand. We want to know if you know anything about her. The woman, panicking, tried to stay calm and confirmed that indeed she saw her. But once she left the shop, she doesn't know where she could have gone. The father, looking at his sons, suspected something was wrong. As soon as he mentioned his daughter, Rahali started trembling. Her face lost all colors. She was clearly afraid, even though she was trying to hide it. But afraid of what? Not wasting a minute, the brothers and the father grabbed her and took her home with them. At first, asking her nicely to tell them where and what she knew. They quickly resolved to torture, using the foot whipping, the popular Middle Eastern method. Not before long, the old woman, not bearing the pain, confessed. The art killer was the interested public writer. Born around 1850s, he was in his 60s at the time of the murders. According to Rahali, with her help, they used to trick ladies, offering them drugged food or beverages to incapacitate them. Then, he would mutilate their bodies and cut their heads off. Afterwards, he would steal whatever valuables they had on them and finally bury them. Having this breakthrough information, having done the authorities' job, the family went to them, presenting them with the solution of the problem. They only needed to catch the culprit. Once behind bars, also under torture, the arch killer, Haj Muhammad Masfawi, confessed and cooperated showing the burial sites. The Moroccan authorities found the mutilated remains of 20 women in a deep pit under his shop, where 16 others were found in the garden outside. The killer was sentenced to death by crucifixion for his horrendous murders and was said to be killed on May 2, 1906. However, because of protests from foreigners living in the city, arguing that, that it was an inhumane sentence, they decided on beheading him. Facing this time the protest of the Marrakesh inhabitants who wanted him to suffer. While trying to decide on the sentence he should be given, in the meantime, he was put in jail, and every day would be taken on the back of a donkey, carried around to be insulted, spat on and thrown rotten food at, to finally arrive in the market square. There, he would be taken down from the back of the donkey, his shirt removed or unbuttoned down to his hips. His arms would be held apart by two men, and he would receive ten lashes, not more, not less with thorn rods made from acacia tree. 
Every day, since May 15, he was taken back to his cell, where the wounds would be treated with oil and vinegar to avoid any infection and make sure he wouldn't die under the lashes nor because of an infection. Unlike Rahali, who succumbed to the pain quickly after she was inflicted the same torture. Every day was similar to the next and to the one before it, but eventually, the authorities decided on a sentence suited for his crimes, or so they believed. He would be walled up alive in the bazaar that stood in Marrakesh marketplace on June 11, 1906. Preparing for it, two maçons created a hole in the bazaar's thick wall about two feet deep and wide and about six feet high. Chains were fixed on the back wall to keep Miss Fairway standing. The execution wasn't a novelty, but it was almost a tale told by the grandparents to the children to scare them, telling them the stories of men and women walled up, who stayed alive for days, sometimes weeks, with people passing by hearing their desperate cries, before suffocating or dying from hunger. That day became a sort of attraction for the public, people coming from all around the country, booking hotel rooms and preparing to witness that event. They were eager to see and hear for days a person locked behind a wall, buried alive in an upright tomb, ready to witness a slow, painful death. On the day of the execution, Miss Fawi was taken as usual in the back of the donkey. He thought the same would happen to him. No one told him what his sentence was, nor when it would be carried out. When arriving closer to the wall, however, held from both arms by guards, seeing the wall and the unusual crowd gathered, he understood. Crying, begging for mercy, he was pushed in the small opening and chained to the inside wall, while the maçon started to pile up the bricks, while people were throwing filth at him and shouting. Held upright in the hole thanks to the metal chain that hung to either side, Miss Fawi stood there, weeping, as the stones were starting to be put in place, with the executioner providing him with water and bread in between, making sure he would stay alive as long as possible. Finally, the last stone covered Miss Fawi's face, and only his muffled cries could be heard. There was a heavy silence in the square, but every time Miss Fairy screamed behind the wall, the crowd would cheer. For two days he was heard, his voice dimming every time. By Wednesday, June 13, 1906, the old man was just moaning, and hours later he stopped eventually. He was dead. To the disappointment of the public who wanted him to suffer more, who expected him to stay alive for at least a week. Their entertainment was cut short and they didn't shy out from voicing their anger. Very few details exist about the victims and sadly the authorities didn't seem keen on having more information beside the confession. The killer wasn't asked about potential other victims, nor where the heads were buried. What did you think of his execution? I hope you enjoyed this new story. Until next time, stay safe. Let us take a moment of silence for all the 36 unnamed victims. <laughs>